This year, again, I was very pleased that uh, the papers selected um, really mapped all across our uh, starting strength coaches library map that we use. So we had papers on kinetics and kinematics, on biophysical anatomy, all in the, the uh, rubric of biomechanics. Uh, we had a lot on exercise physiology, and you'll notice that some of these papers, they locate to more than one part of the library map. So there's actually not that many papers. So a lot of them covered more than one part of the library map. Um, a lot on big medicine, uh, on biomedical applications in various uh, subfields. Uh, I, I'd like to see more, program, uh, more papers on programming. The problem with programming papers is that you know, they suck even more than the papers that we pick. There's not a lot of really, really robust programming literature out there, but we have our eyes open for it. And training, coaching, and performance. Uh, most of these were on general coaching practice and concepts. There was one that did fit in 5A, metrics, biomarkers, and benchmarks. That will be the muscle mass index paper that we'll talk about. It actually goes into that category as well. Uh, a couple of profession-specific uh, papers, particularly having to do with military. And um, one sports medicine paper and a couple that fit into the nutrition, supplements, and drugs category. So a pretty good cross-section. Uh, I was pretty happy that, again, that's how it came out. So um, let's get to it. Uh, before we do, um, like I was, uh, Jordan and I were talking in the back, we could take one of these papers and some pizza and beer and some residents and make a three-hour journal club out of it. Just one. Um, and so I want you to uh, interrupt me with any questions that you have, any comments that you have, but we do want to try and maintain, you know, the view from 20,000 feet. So if you ask me, like, why did they do the Fisher's T-test instead of the chi-square, I'm, I'm going to say, dude, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> right? So what we're really interested in is how this fits conceptually uh, or not with what we do. If you have questions about uh, the particular methodology, I'm available to you. The other members of the committee are available to you. If you have very specific questions about these papers, it doesn't have to end. Matt called me at home and, and like started pimping me about like the methodology on some of these papers. Do that. I, that's cool. I think that's great. So, um, but today we're going to try and we're going to try and cover as much ground as we can. So we'll try and have more of a 20,000 foot altitude kind of point of view. First paper is uh, Gripping Matters by our very own beloved Jordan Feigenbaum uh, in the categories of biomechanics and also training, coaching, performance, general coaching concepts. This is a uh, bioanatomical and biophysical evaluation of the grip for the pressing movements. And in this nice little piece, Jordan lays out three criteria for the grip in pressing movements using a bioanatomical perspective. So, um, he starts with the anatomy of the forearm and wrist. This is one of two slides that addresses the anatomy of the forearm and wrist. The uh, wrist consists of a bunch of little gravelly carpal bones and one forearm bone, or according to some anatomists, both forearm bones, the radius and the ulna. We're going to start with the forearm bones because that addresses the first of these criteria. The two forearm bones are the radius and the ulna, and they sort of like move in opposite directions in the forearm. At the wrist, the radius is a very broad, strong bone, and by the time it gets to the elbow, it's, it's a very thin bone. It's got that little sort of radial head that allows you to pronate and supinate where it articulates with the capitellum. The ulna, which isn't, according to Jordan's analysis, a wrist bone, starts out as a skinny little chicken bone, kind of fragile down here. This ulnar styloid, let me see if I can make this thing work. Maybe. The ulnar styloid, this whole part here, is frequently fractured. Um, and, but by the time it gets down to the elbow, it's a great big bone. In fact, it is what most of us think of as the elbow. When you like slam somebody's elbow or slam your elbow into somebody else or rest it on the bar, it's the olecranon of the ulna. That's that big part down there that articulates with the humerus to form the hinge part of the elbow joint. So the elbow joint is both a hinge joint and it's able to do this pronation supination thing. So the two forearm bones sort of move in opposite directions. Now, 
If you stand in the anatomical position, you'll observe what's called a carrying angle of the forearm with the humerus, right? And if you can suffer through a little bit of teleological evolutionary reasoning here, that's so that you can carry stuff without constantly, if, you're, if this was your carrying angle, that would be a little bit of a problem. And since monkeys like to carry things, this is the forearm angle, the carrying angle that we have developed. And it's good for that purpose. However, it's not very good for pressing movements or for uh, developing an axial load on the forearm. The bones aren't lined up well. Here again, uh, you can see the radius, a broad bone down here, a smaller bone down here where it articulates with the capitellum. Starts, the ulna starts as a tiny bone up here, forms a big hinge joint down here. This is the carrying angle. And because there is an angle here, it's not going to be very good for the transmission of axial forces along the forearm to the humerus to the shoulder girdle. so you can press, either a bench press or an overhead press, right? And you'll observe that if I'm in the anatomical position and I flex my elbow, the carry, if I just flex my elbow and don't do anything else, that carrying angle is preserved. And once again, I don't have a very good configuration of the structure for the transmission of axial forces. What Jordan points out correctly is, is that the first criteria must be to align our forearm bones with our humerus in a favorable way. And the way we do that is by pronating the forearm, right? And that causes the radius to cross over the ulna, and it causes this linear arrangement. Now, it, again, if I stand in the anatomical position and I flex my elbows, I'm at a poor carrying L. All I have to do is pronate the forearm, and that goes away. And I'm in the pressing position. So that is the first criteria, the pronation of the forearm. Now, we need to have a vertically oriented radius. So now we've, we've taken the carrying angle out of the equation, but we want our radius to be vertically oriented in the sagittal plane. We want it to be vertically oriented in the coronal plane too, but the second criteria is we want to vertically orient the radius in the sagittal plane. Now you would think that if I stand here and my forearm, my forearm, my antebrachium is vertical, right, that my radius would be vertical, but it's not. If you actually look at what's happening here, hard to find the right position here, but if I'm here and my forearm is vertical, my radius is actually traveling backwards to my elbow. That's just the anatomy. And so the second of our criteria is to make the radius vertical, we have to put the point of the elbow, the olecranon, just in front of the center of mass of the bar. And that results in a vertical orientation of the radius. The radius, after all, is the bone that's going to transmit force from the wrist down to the elbow. This is actually a picture of, you know, Jordan, there's something wrong with this elbow here. Uh, but it does, it does give us a good picture of what's going on. You can see that this is the radius. And here it's articulating with the capitellum. But the point of the olecranon is forward of the radius. This gives you a vertically oriented radius to transmit forces from the wrist down to the elbow. So that is the second criterion because it gives us a vertical radius in the sagittal plane. The third of these criteria takes us back to the, to the carpum, the wrist, the wrist proper, and the carpal bones. These are the carpal bones. The, the scaphoid, lunate, uh, triquetrum, pisiform, hamate, capitate, uh, trapezoid, and trapezium. I mean, if you look at the anatomy of the wrist, you can see where you want those forces to go. This is the thumb metacarpal. This is the first index metacarpal. So this is where the gripping is going to occur. And the forces you want to be transmitted really across these three great big frickin' bones right here, scaphoid, capitate, lunate onto the broad head of the radius. That's, what, that's the transmission of forces that you want. You don't want to be transmitting forces down these two metacarpals and into these bones and onto this bone, which isn't even really part of the wrist. Which is why if you, if you get drunk and you punch somebody and you don't know what you're doing and you hit them with these last two fingers, you can take these two fingers in your hand and you can see how mobile they are. Not great for the transmission of forces compared to the two prime fingers, right? fairly rigid, right? That's why if you punch somebody with the last two fingers, you're going to end up with a boxer's fracture, which is a classic misnomer because boxers who know what they're doing never get them, right? So 
<clears throat> Boxer's fracture is the fracture of these two metacarpals because you can't transmit the forces into the bone, into the forearm. So you want the forces to be transmitted down these big carpal bones onto the broad head of the radius down into the elbow. If we look at it from the side and see, see it from the side, the same sort of thing, you can see this is called the three C's of the wrist, right? The capitate, the lunate, and this, again, this broad head of the, uter uh, of the humerus, the uterus. And we want the forces to be transmitted straight down from the grip where the bar is held onto the humerus. And you'll notice that if we do that, if we set it up so that those forces are transmitted directly down into the humerus, or in, into the uh, uh, radius, that the wrist will be in slight extension. It will not be in the intrinsic or neutral position. These are the neutral angles of the, of the upper extremities. So in general, if you injure one of your upper extremities, you'll be, you'll be uh, immobilized at these angles, with the exception of the wrist. These are the this is the Big Mac position is the neutral position of uh, the neutral uh, position of all the joints of the upper extremity. Except for the wrist. When you're immobilized, if you come to me with a broken wrist and I immobilize you, or if you come to an orthopod with a broken wrist and we immobilize you, how do we immobilize you? We immobilize you in some extension. Right? The intrinsic plus position is called. We immobilize you in some extension. Why do we do that? We do that because wrists freeze. Sometimes when you immobilize a wrist and it comes out of the splinter, or it comes out of the cast, now you have a stuck wrist, right? This is especially true of like people who don't take very good care of their bodies and little old ladies and stuff. Now, they're, now you've got one great big wrist bone there and the wrist doesn't work very well. By immobilizing them in extension, you've retained what we call the power grip. So everyone take a pen or something and squeeze it really, really hard, as hard as you can, and look at your wrist. It's in slight extension. It's not in a neutral position. Now take your wrist and flex it slightly or even just leave it neutral and grab it real hard. It's not nearly as much fun, right? When you make a fist, when, when G.I. Joe does the Kung Fu grip, he is in about 15 degrees of wrist extension, right? And that has to do with this rule of 537, which I'm going to leave you to read the article about. Nice discussion of that, right? So keeping the wrist in slight extension allows for the proper transmission of forces to the forearm bones and thence down to the elbow. That is the third criteria. Uh, the next paper, I know Jordan likes this paper too. Uh, he nominated it and um, he wrote a very nice abstract of it. We're going to go over it a little bit. This is uh, the paper on exercise nutrition and aging muscle by Dickinson et al. Uh, published in Exercise Sports Science Review in, not in 3013, we didn't go forward in time to get this paper, 2013, relatively recent. Uh, this is an implicit review, it's not an original investigation or uh, even a systematic review, um, but it is a pretty comprehensive review of where the literature is on this topic. And in this paper, the authors put forth a model of age-related sarcopenia uh, brought about by a combination of decreased physical activity, so you don't use the muscle enough, and a general geriatric anabolic resistance. So even if you do use the muscle, you're more resistant to training and nutritional effects than your younger, less deserving counterparts. So they, they point out that this anabolic resistance is multifactorial, and the factors that they concentrate on are amino acid resistance, or resistance to dietary protein and amino acids, insulin resistance, which has effects on both signaling and blood flow, and the blood flow itself, which they put forward as insulin mediated. And I like this paper because it highlights the central importance of insulin signaling in aging and sarcopenia and health. This figure is, looks imposing and intimidating. It's in the article. Um, but there are really just a few things that I want to draw your attention to. And the big one is right here, this bad boy right here, mTOR. mTOR is a sort of a switching central enzyme in metabolism. mTOR 
signals to a bunch of transcription and elongation factors and other factors that regulate the initiation and the continuation of protein synthesis in all types of cells, and in particular, muscle cells. <clears throat> mTOR gets turned on by this protein called AKT and some other proteins as well. AKT is in turn activated by the insulin receptor substrate, which is turned on by insulin. So insulin signaling and IGF-1 signaling and other growth factors signal through AKT to turn on mTOR, which turns on protein synthesis and leads in muscle to muscle protein accretion, right, to more muscle. mTOR turned on by insulin, more protein synthesis. Exercise leads through a number of different pathways, including possibly the mechano growth factor receptor, an isoform of the insulin-like um, insulin, um, growth factor, turns on mTOR, turns on protein synthesis. So exercise has a direct signaling effect, not very well worked out yet. There are some real good candidates. But, ins but exercise itself turns on mTOR, which turns on protein synthesis, which leads to muscle protein accretion. And amino acid ingestion, steak, amino acid juice, whatever, right? Amino acids in the serum, amino acid availability, turns on mTOR, which turns on protein synthesis and leads to muscle protein accretion. Turning off mTOR leads to autophagy, basically eating oneself, right, and, and apoptosis in some systems, right? So you don't want mTOR to be turned off. You want mTOR to be turned on. You now know what you need to know about this figure. Amino acids turn on mTOR, turns on protein synthesis. Exercise turns on mTOR, turns on protein synthesis. Insulin and other growth factors turn on mTOR, turn on protein synthesis. More muscle gains, right? So the problem is, <laughs> good, uh, the, uh, the problem is, is that all three of these stimuli of mTOR are suppressed or you're resistant to them as you get more like me, right? As you get older, mTOR is more resistant to all of these stimuli. This is the model of sarcopenia that the authors are putting up. Inactivity, right, obviously leads to anabolic resistance and sarcopenia. You lose motor units, particularly type 2 motor units as you get older, sarcopenia. Chronic inflammation, where does that come from? Loss of insulin signaling Cross among <laughs> CrossFit and loss of insulin signaling lead to uh, chronic oxidative stress. The mitochondria don't get as good at their job. You're, le uh, you're less able to handle oxidative stress, free radicals, right? That leads to all kinds of, and leads to chronic inflammation, sarcopenia. Satellite cells we talked to you about at the last meeting. We had a couple of papers on that, again, chosen by Jordan. Um, Satellite cells or the ability of satellite cells to turn into muscle is diminished in aging, sarcopenia. Hormonal changes, not enough T, whatever, sarcopenia. DNA damage, apoptosis, I know some of you have heard that word before. Injury and illness, prolonged debilitation, sarcopenia. And insulin resistance, which I think is a real big player here. So you're getting it on all fronts. You're getting it on all fronts, and your ability to respond with new protein synthesis in the muscle, stimulated by exercise, stimulated by amino acids, stimulated by normal insulin signaling, all diminished, right? So not a lot of good news there. But the good news is that amino acid resistance is not absolute, it is relative. And it may be overcome by more amino acids. The bottom line here is, is that if you look at this literature, what you find is older athletes need more, not less protein, contrary to what some of their doctors are still telling them. And if you give them enough, if you give them enough of a load of amino acids, especially immediately after a workout, you can overcome to some degree 
that amino acid resistance which contributes to sarcopenia. The resistance to exercise is also not absolute. We all know that because a lot of us work with older clients and you've seen literature in this very forum that you can, in this very forum, that you can make older people stronger and increase their muscle mass through resistance training. It's a dose response effect, just like the amino acids, right? If you, if you administer enough of a dose through progressive resistance training, you can still stimulate muscle protein accretion. You can overcome that relative resistance, anabolic resistance. And although the authors do not discuss it, it's also important to point out that insulin resistance itself, global insulin resistance and muscle insulin resistance, can be partially overcome by resistance training. That is also in the literature, and I'll be talking about it in Pennsylvania in a couple of weeks. So um, uh, that is a putative mechanism for the anabolic response. The authors also talk about blood flow to the muscle and how that is, or may be, an insulin-mediated phenomenon as well. Insulin's kind of funny. In some clinical settings, insulin can be a vasoconstrictor and make your blood pressure go up. Certain kinds of poisonings and stuff like that, we use insulin as a vasopressor to drive the blood pressure up. But in a more physiological sense, it's a vasodilator because insulin signaling leads to the release of nitric oxide, which is a, uh, a relaxer of blood vessels and causes the blood pressure to be lower. That is why hypertension is associated with insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome. If you decrease the blood flow to muscle, you're going to decrease the anabolic response of muscle to any particular stimulus. Now, here's a little bit of that good news that we talked about. This figure here is where um, they took young guys, and they took geezers, right? and they measured their baseline muscle fractional protein synthetic rate. What do you notice about that? They're all pretty much the same, and that's one of the key take-home points of this paper. Right? Your, your baseline muscle fractional protein synthetic rate is not that much different. Right? Your muscle breakdown may be more, so you need to make more muscle protein to stay even but you're anabolically resistant, so it's harder for you to make more muscle protein. Here's a perfect example of that. They took these guys and they uh, gave them all a workout, but without a feeding. And they measured their muscle fractional protein synthetic rate. Resistance exercise only, no feeding, right? The young guys mounted a little bit more three hours post uh, uh, resistance exercise. Again, the young guys mounted a little bit more. Six hours post resistance exercise, the older guys are finally catching up and surpassing them. So you can overcome the anabolic resistance with a sufficient bout of resistance exercise and sufficient feeding after resistance exercise. If as you as Jordan once told me once, as soon as you put the bar in the rack, right, your amino acid drink while you're cooking your steak, right, <laughs> kind of thing, right. So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the doggy bag from this paper, the take home. Sarcopenia in older individuals is complex, it's multifactorial, and it's at least partially responsive to behavioral and training in interventions. Muscle protein synthesis remains relatively responsive to training and nutritional manipulations to the extremes of age, right? They just need a bigger dose. They need a little bit more intensity, and they need more protein, and they need more branched-chain amino acids. Older trainees are exquisitely dependent on large post-exercise protein amino acid loads. So a word to the wise is sufficient especially branched-chain amino acids, so chow down. And I would never give nutritional advice to any of my older clients, right? <laughs> but I might suggest to them that studies have shown that there's more muscle protein accretion in older lifters when they take their branched-chain amino acids and eat their steak immediately after a workout. 